thank you for the invitation uh, to be here this evening. Uh, thank you to the chaplains for uh, their work. Uh, and thank you to, to you, Professor Adair, and to the wider university uh, for the interest that you have taken as uh, the university develops, particularly in this part of Belfast. Uh, in your um, concern for and passion that the churches be involved in and taken account of in this development. Uh, we are grateful to you for that and appreciate it very much indeed. Thank you. The church as a catalyst for change in a post-conflict society. And I've got to begin with a title like that with a question. And the question is this, is it the utmost in arrogance? to suggest that the church might actually have a role in being a catalyst for change in this society. For integrity's sake, I have to begin with that question, because the truth is that even the youngest first year undergrad would find it very easy to find quotations from scholars and from commentators which emphasise impotence on behalf of the church in terms of transformation and of peace building. I don't intend to spend this lecture looking back and doing that sort of analysis, but we must sketch a bit of context because we do not begin from nowhere. In a lecture given as part of the West Belfast Festival last August, Professor John Brewer suggested that while the substance of the conflict here was political, that it was experienced as a religious conflict. He went on to say, sometimes by choice then, and always by default, the churches were thought of as central to the conflict. This perception still dogs the churches as a legacy of the past. Despite their condemnation of violence, the churches were not seen as neutral and above the fray. They were seen as part of the problem. Wrapped up in the conflict, they were seen as incapable of making themselves relevant to the peace. So the question we've got to begin with is, are we the church incapable of making ourselves relevant to the church, to the peace? Because it's often said that the church was, and perhaps is, thought of as part of the problem as well as part of the solution here. That is reflected, as has been noted by many others, in the almost total omission of any role for the church in towards building a united community. Despite the fact that that document promotes actions in youth work, for example, in which the church has been integrally involved for years. So has the church been so enmeshed in the problem so consumed with inward looking issues that we've lost the opportunity of being involved in either peace building or community transformation beyond perhaps the occasional polite societal nod in the direction of the churches. My contention tonight and in life is that the church must have a role must be a catalyst for change. And that statement is not made as a demand from the church for a place at the table, nor is it a statement about the right of the church to be involved. I make the statement that the church must have a role in peace building and societal transformation simply as a Christian and as a representative Christian person, as a statement not of rights and not of demand, but of humble obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church must be a force for change because that is part of what the church in the power of God's spirit is called to be. And if we, the church, hold back from our responsibilities, then we're being unfaithful and turning away from our calling. In his Catherwood lecture last October, David Porter called on the church to be the church. He simply said, let the church be the church. I can't put it any better. 
If the church is to be the church, then we must be obedient to Jesus and to Jesus' command and invitation to follow him. And I also need to say on the way past that my experience is that Christians want to be involved in peace building and in transformation. The question that I've been asked most frequently on my travels this year on peace building and on reconciliation is not should the churches be involved in this. The question I am asked most frequently is what can I do? What can I, as an individual Christian, as part of a Christian community, do? We do not start from nowhere. The church has been seen as part of the problem. We do not start from nowhere. My call is for the church to recognise that we must be involved in peace building if we are to be faithful to Jesus. We do not start from nowhere. And before we move on to look at what the church's role might look like, if we're to be honest, we need to recognise that a lot is going on. Often quietly and without drawing attention to itself, the church has been and is actively involved in peace building and in societal change. We could draw stories and examples from all of our traditions. I'm a Methodist, so part of my tradition is the example of people like Eric Gallagher. In 1974, the Reverend Eric Gallagher was among church leaders who met the IRA and Sinn Féin leaders in Fecal to talk about an end to violence. Profoundly courageous actions at a time when meeting the IRA was thought of as beyond the pale for many. Susan Hughes' Quiet Peacemakers exhibition of a number of portraits, Martin McGill, Leslie Carroll, Joan True, uh, the sisters at, at Dromalis, many of the subjects whose actions are motivated to Christian faith, who have without fanfare quietly got on with peace building. The Haas Hope initiative in March, which gathered young people to discuss the Haas proposals and which ended up with a call to action from Bishop Harold Miller. The Irish Church's Peace Project, sponsored by the four churches before main churches and the Irish Council of Churches, working on the ground in key areas across Northern Ireland. The relationships that are being built and exist between individual parishes and congregations. Church of the Good Shepherd, a joint Church of Ireland and Methodist congregation in Monkstown and St Oliver Plunkett Parish in Lenadoon. We could spend many hours telling the stories, giving the examples of work which the church is doing. We do not start from nowhere. And I'm grateful for the fact that there are many stories to tell and many examples to give. Not everywhere, not always, but often. The church is integrally involved in the community of which it is a part is already a catalyst for change. So the focus of the remainder of what I will say is going to be not on should the church be involved, I'm taking that as a given, nor will my focus be on can the church be involved. Let's recognise that it's a challenge but we can and we must. The focus on what I am going to say is on how. How might the church be a catalyst for change in this society? And in addressing that question, I found myself needing to speak primarily to the church as a church person. So if you're not a church person, please forgive me and listen as a critical friend. How might the church be a catalyst for change? Well, the first thing I want to say is that the institution has a role to play. Significant criticism has been levelled at the church as an institution with regard to its, our, lack of engagement in peace building. My view is that some of that criticism may be warranted, but some of it is not. The church as an institution clearly has a role to play in peace building. 
there is a place for public statements, especially, I think, when those statements come in the name of the churches rather than one tradition. So, for example, after the meeting which the Secretary of State called on dealing with the past uh, in April, church leaders issued a statement which focused on the relationship between welfare reform and dealing with the past, because concerns about welfare reform in the context of dealing with the past and Haas were the live concerns in the room that morning. That statement also called for a politics of fulfilment which moves beyond simply the delivery of services to positive peace building and a fulfilled society. It seems to me that there is an institutional place for these public statements. But particularly, it seems to me that the institutional or organisational level has a role to play both as permission giver in peace building and as ethos builder. My experience is that that permission giving ethos is there across the churches and it's evidenced in the joint statement which was issued post Haas. Listen to one of the paragraphs. As Christians, we emphasize the value of building trust in a spirit of generosity and forgiveness. We encourage every member of our community and church and parishes to be instruments of reconciliation and peace building. I believe there is a permission giving ethos across the churches, desiring, wanting to foster peace building covering the backs of those who have the courage uh, to work on the edges in terms of peace building. And clearly there is an institutional role in fostering an ethos across the church in which concern about society is not allowed to simply loiter at the edges of our interest or our rhetoric or our action. That is not where concern about society belongs in the life of the church. It belongs front and centre in who we are as church and has implications for preaching and teaching, for training and as well as social action. I believe that there is a role for the institution in peace building and societal transformation and I believe that there's evidence to say that the church as institution has and is stepping into that role. Second piece of an answer to how is about commitment to the common good. We are a fragmented society. For generations, we've divided into our separate corners, cut off from each other by ignorance, by suspicion, by hatred. We carry that heritage, sadly, in our bones. And sectarianism shifts almost seamlessly into racism. The identity of those on the margins may change, but the fact that many feel and experience that they are on the margins does not change. I long and with many others look for the day when diversity is valued, when we engage meaningfully with each other, when we differ and differ strongly and stay in relationship with each other. I long for the day when we work as hard for the rights of others as we work for our own. A theological understanding which affirms without condition God's love for all and therefore the value which God places on all people gives a firm basis for striving for the common good. I fundamentally believe that God loves all, not some, not many, all. If societal transformation is to have roots, all must have a voice. Otherwise we replicate the patterns of the past and some end up not just feeling marginalised but experiencing being marginalised. Now, do we the church have the courage to speak up 
and say that every voice matters, even the voices which we personally and corporately find it really difficult to hear. That point was brought home to me last week in the meeting called by uh, Assistant Chief Constable Will Kerr, which was aimed at developing a united response to hate crime and racism. The discussion in the room was wide-ranging and open. We rightly heard the voices of some who had experienced racism. We rightly heard the voices of some who are working in community to combat racism and hate crime and its root causes. One person spoke up and courageously spoke the difficult words. He reminded the meeting that we need a way forward which includes and engages with every voice, including those who are undertaking racist attacks. Those challenging words, which echo God's love for all, are the sort of words that the church needs to be speaking. The church has the potential to be the catalyst for change because she should have the clear motive for desiring the common good. Good for all, not just good for me and good for mine. An institutional role, a desire for the common good, partnership. It seems to me that a faithful Christian response in this generation demands humbly and with grace entering into partnerships within the church, but far broader than the church, also across civil society. When he spoke to a group in Ballymena last February, the Coadjutor Archbishop of Armagh, Dr Eamon Martin, advocated the development of what he called covenants of friendship at congregational and parish level. He said this, making a solemn Christian commitment to friendship and good relations, to treat each other with dignity, respect, understanding and tolerance and friendship, compromises no doctrinal those declarations of friendship across our churches and between our churches are undoubtedly helpful. With many others, I believe that reconciliation is a relationship-centric process because it's in the context of relationships that we can have the very difficult conversations. Psalm 85 speaks of mercy and truth meeting together and of righteousness and peace kissing. Now we know, we know very well in this society that the claims of mercy and claims of truth can be intention. John to Paul Laderach suggests that a place called reconciliation is where different conflicting parties meet and honestly in relationship face together the claims and tensions between truth and mercy, justice and peace. Reconciliation, dealing with the past, is a relationship-centric process and we'll only move on from suspicion and misunderstanding to respect and understanding when we develop relationships with each other which go beyond polite nods and pleasantries. That move towards covenants of friendship may well be a step towards the further development of that quality of relationship. And the church, the church needs to be willing to enter into other partnerships as well. Historically, we haven't been great at that. The church has been used to being at the centre of things, powerful enough to feel that we do not need to partner with anyone. But we will not be a catalyst for peace building by shouting from a distance. Nor do I believe that there's any place for a separatist or isolationist theology. If the church is going to be involved, let alone be a catalyst for transformation, we need to be willing to build relationships within and throughout civil society. Johnson McMaster describes the importance of a practice of humility in reconciliation. He says humility is the sharing of ideas, 
not imposing them on one another. With that quality of humility, with grace and secure in our identity, because the church does have a contribution to make, I believe that we need to initiate and respond to invitation to partnerships within civil society, with academia, with business, with trade unions, with the aim of working together for the common good. Partnerships are called for. Speaking theology in the public square. For a number of reasons, I think that the church, we the church, are hesitant about speaking theology in public and a number of those reasons are legitimate. One legitimate reason for our hesitancy to speak theology in the public square is that we know that theology has been manipulated and misused as the servant of our thinking rather than the master or even resource or partner. Our history is tinged with theological language and what are, for me, unhelpful theological references. There are echoes of it in the Ulster Covenant. It's been emblazoned on our walls in For God and Ulster. Theology has been distorted and used to imply that God is on my side and therefore not on yours. Theology has been used to demean, to judge, to build a pattern of thinking and practice which implied that some could be overlooked or less valued and we need to own those distortions. We need to reflect on the theology of redemptive violence. I agree with David Porter when he says that violence cannot be the basis of nation building. I am therefore one of those Christians who believes that we the church need to say sorry for those distortions and for any actions which developed from them. I was proud of the Belfast district of the Methodist Church in Ireland when we attempted to do that reflection on the anniversary of the Ulster Covenant. A further legitimate reason that we hesitate about speaking theology in the public square is that we knew that to do so creates demands on us. We dare not speak of love for neighbour, let alone love for enemy, and then hold back from love. We dare not speak of forgiveness, and then fence forgiveness round with all sorts of caveats and conditions. But I say this humbly, and I say it firmly, in the light of what I said a few minutes ago about partnership. The public discourse will be impoverished if we do not dare to speak theologically. Public discourse and the action which must emerge from that discourse demands that words like forgiveness and love and justice be spoken. Those words need to be restored to the public conversation. They have the potential to be a gift that the church can offer. In his book From Faithful Reading to Faithful Living, Walter Brueggemann reflects on the exchange between the Assyrian negotiator Rabshakeh, King Hezekiah and Isaiah in 2 Kings 18 and 19. Situation is this, Jerusalem is under siege and Rabshakeh, the Assyrian negotiator, comes to the city gate. He's coming combative. He's coming with the aim of wanting to negotiate a surrender. And two conversations develop. The first conversation is a conversation on the city wall. It takes place in the language of public discourse, political language. And the other conversation which develops is a conversation behind the city wall, where Isaiah the prophet Now these two conversations scarcely overlap, but they are about the same reality. Brueggemann points out the issue hinges on which is the true conversation. Is it true that a serious conversation must include the prophet and the living God because they really matter? Or is it true that they are simply imaginary characters in the drama that has no contact with reality? What constitutes social reality, Brueggemann asks. Now the text itself doesn't make a judgment on that. 
But what is clear is that the conversation behind the wall, the theological conversation about God, makes a difference to the conversation that takes place on the wall. And the conversation behind the wall in the life of God's people has priority. It's through that God-based theological conversation that the situation is interpreted by the people of God. And it's that theological reflection that resources the conversation on the wall. Now, in this context, Israel discovers that if she is to respond in a way that will be understood on and beyond the wall, but more importantly, in a way that reflects faithfulness to God, then Israel needs to be bilingual. They need to learn the language of the wall, the political language and the theological language. The American ethicist Stanley Harvis says this, Without Israel having a language behind the wall, there would be no way to resist the seduction of the language on the wall with its claim that Yahweh has been defeated. Brueggemann goes on to say, and I cannot agree with him more, Christians need to be nurtured to be bilingual. The gift, one of the gifts, which I dare to say that the church brings to peace building is not political engagement because we're not in that sense politicians. The church's distinctive is a view resist, resourced by biblical and theological engagement. The church's distinctive is a view resourced by biblical and theological engagement. Even over the last few months, but it's been going on for years, but even over the last few months, there's evidence of the church offering that distinctive voice into the public discourse. Last, let's see. Last October, For God and His Glory Alone was relaunched. 25 years ago, For God and His Glory Alone brought theological reflection on themes that included justice, righteousness, hope, repentance, citizenship, and truth. It deserved to be relaunched. David Spoke Porter spoke that evening, and I was profoundly challenged by one of his throwaway remarks. He commented that in the early days of Akonai, evangelical contribution on Northern Ireland, the staff of Akonai used to joke and guess how many people would walk out of a Konai public meetings because they had been so challenged by what had been said. A Konai's input, biblically resourced on peace building, made from a Christian perspective to Christians, was so challenging, so thought provoking, that Christians walked out. I was profoundly challenged because I'm not aware of anyone ever having walked out of a lecture or a sermon or a talk that I have given because it has been so challenging that it evoked anger. And I heard Porter's comments as a call for the church to be a biblically resourced, theologically informed, prophetic, uncomfortable voice. And in very recent months post Haas, a small group, now under the auspices of the Irish Interchurch Meeting, has been meeting to develop meaningful theological reflection on key biblical themes. The fact that this is a cross-church group, the fact that they're endeavouring to do in-depth theological reflection, makes this a significant development. It's a good example of thinking going on behind the wall, now being communicated on the wall. This group has developed a set of principles which they would like to see underpinning political engagement. There it is. We believe in a community, that in a community based on Christian values, oops, no, it's not. peace is nurtured and genuine reconciliation facilitated so that all can live free from violence and the threat of violence. We believe in a community based in Christian values, truthfulness is encouraged. 
fostering trust and forming the basis for dealing with the pain of the past, engaging with present problems and forging a more hopeful future for all. Diversity is celebrated and our interdependence is recognised while sectarianism, racism and other prejudices that collect, create a climate of fear and division are rejected. That collect, create a climate of fear and division are rejected. Democracy is cherished and fully participative. The rule of law respected and all communities are liberated from the oppressive grip of organised criminal, criminality and paramilitary activity. Justice is treasured and all citizens are treated equally under the law, while victims are treated with compassion and social wrongs being set right, so that all might enjoy personal dignity and equality of opportunity. Rights are valued and mutually respected within a context where people also recognize their mutual responsibilities and relationships. Hope and imagination are fostered thus transforming the dynamic of public life and raising personal aspirations. It's important to note, and David Campton highlighted this when he reflected on these principles in his blog, that the church must not only speak those principles into the public square, but must, if there is to be integrity, speak those principles to herself. A role for the institution God's love for all, which means more concern for more than us and ours. Partnership, theological thinking as a resource uh, for public discourse, as something with the potential, don't worry about it, as something with the potential to shape imagination and for the church as the primary and prior conversation. How might the church take a role in fostering and being a catalyst for change. I think there's also a role in modeling a different reality. There is, I believe, a role for the church in helping to shape moral imagination. As a community, we must move beyond vague talking about a better future to talking in concrete terms about what that future is going to look like. I long for a future where I don't have to think or I don't have the thought entering my head. Is this a Catholic or a Protestant area? I long for a future in which I want my children to stay here. I long for a future where we're secure in, ident in our identity and don't want to celebrate identity in a way that hurts others. I long for a future where we are not hampered by fear. As we begin to talk together in concrete terms about what a shared future might look like, there's a strong Judeo-Christian heritage on which we can draw. The prophets of the Old Testament had such a depth of commitment to God and to the message that God had entrusted to them that they didn't just speak the message, although speaking the message frequently got them into trouble. They dared to believe that it was and would be true, and they lived in the light of God's word to them. Jeremiah, for example, is given a difficult message to speak. It's difficult because he loves the people of Judah, and it's difficult because it's a message of judgment, and he's going to be unpopular. But in Jeremiah 32, we're told that in a time of national crisis and personal pressure, Jeremiah is told that he's to buy a field in his home area of Anathoth as a sign that what the Lord says is true, that houses and fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land. And Jeremiah dares to trust God enough that he puts his money where his mouth is and he buys the field as a sign of God's commitment and as a sign of God's future. We have 21st century prophets who are doing that too. Zachariah's prophetic ministry took place in the post-exilic period, during the period when the Jewish nation were returning to Jerusalem and building the city up again. This is Zechariah 8 verse 4. Here's what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem. 
each of them with cane in hand because of their age. The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. When the Skynos project was being developed in Inner East Belfast, long before the building was in place, reflecting on that verse from Zechariah chapter 8, the Skynos director, Glenn Jordan, asked, What if, what if we dared to take prophecies like that literally? What if the streets of Inner East Belfast were a place where women and men could sit and watch the world go by? What if the streets in Inner East Belfast were a place where children could dwell and play in safety? And they made themselves go beyond comfortable what-ifs and dreams to concrete thinking and concrete plans. What would we need in order for that to happen? And as part of the Skanos development, they built a garden where children play and where old men and old women can sit and watch the world go by. We have 21st century prophets who are daring to believe in the hope and the future that God alone can bring. 21st century prophets who dare to live into and up to the message of the Kingdom of God. Gladys Gamiel, in her paper on how clergy can address the legacy of the Troubles, points to the life of the Benedictine monks in Moss Tre Ross Trevor and highlights their prayer life as a kind of prophetic action. Because the monks do not just pray for the leaders of their own church, but for leaders of all the Christian churches. Prophetic action. And here's what I hope. I hope that those of you in, who are listening, who are ordained or lay church leaders, I hope that you're listening, thinking, there's nothing new or radical in praying for the leaders of other churches because there should be nothing new or radical in praying for church leaders across the board. There should be nothing new or radical about speaking well off and treating each other with generosity. Nothing new, nothing radical in acknowledging and rejoicing that God is at work across the whole of God's church and world. In a meeting a couple of months ago now, People from a wide variety of Christian traditions gathered and shared ideas. Many of them could be seen as coming under this heading of modelling a different reality. One person said, what about a sectarianism free charter mark for churches? On the same sort of model as a fair trade scheme, whereby churches would sign up to not fly national flags in churches or intentionally watching the language which is used in public and private. So for example, one of the personal promises I've made is that I will not joke about flags anymore because those jokes undermine and diminish a particular community. Dare we in our language, in our corporate action, in who we are as a people, as a church, dare we, in the strength of God, begin to model a different reality? How might the church be involved as a catalyst in societal transformation, partnership, a role for the institution, speaking theologically, uh, modeling a different reality? Be clear, unequivocal, uncompromising about the church's primary allegiance. This is my final point. Clear, unequivocal, uncompromising about the church's primary allegiance. The Christian's primary allegiance is to Jesus Christ. All other allegiances are secondary. Everything comes under Jesus' lordship. So for those who follow Jesus, allegiance to any political party, allegiance to any other organisation, comes second to allegiance to Jesus. And this is the Jesus 
who clearly taught love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. This is the Jesus who died and who is alive, so that the dividing wall of hostility which divides human beings from God and from each other might be broken down. Anything, anything which mars witness to Jesus, be it allegiance, habit, custom or right, needs to be done away that with. Get that right and we might just begin to be a catalyst for peace building and transformation. And forgive me if this sounds simplistic, but I must speak this clearly. The church is nothing less than a community formed by allegiance to Jesus. Get that right and everything else falls into place. Now I want to point out that what I've said tonight has been deliberately heavily dependent on the work of others. I point that out not just as a matter of academic integrity, but to highlight the fact that Christians are actively involved in change and transformation. That fact stands as a further reason for encouragement and hope. But I finish with this. My academic discipline is practical theology. And one of practical theology's cornerstones is that theological reflection must lead to action. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, one of the challenges which we, the church, face as we seek to be a catalyst in peace building is that there is a gap between talk and action. So I want to highlight some action points, some of which I've mentioned on the way through, others of which I didn't uh, have time to name. The first one is prayer. Pray across the church for community and politicians, for those seen as enemy. The second is about preaching on reconciliation and forgiveness and on themes relevant to positive peace building like justice and courage. Will we dare to partner with God in creating a little bit of holy discomfort? Because sometimes I think we're a little bit too comfortable and not motivated enough in peace building. Thirdly, dare we make theology practical. As I've said, we need to do the theological engagement, but let's make the theology practical. As part of a build-up to a song, which we'll be relieved I'm not going to sing in My Fair Lady, Eliza Doolittle shouts, don't talk of love, show me. Norman Taggart, an Irish Methodist minister, pushes us to point about what showing love looks like in our society. He said this, more must be done to spell out what is involved in this love in defining our political and other aims, in deciding where jobs are created, homes are built, and other facilities provided, and how to undermine violence and establish peace in all of these things, in politics, in jobs, in building of homes, in undermining violence, in establishing peace. We should be guided at every point by Christian love. Action, pray, preach, make theology practical, Listen. Another three ideas that came from that cross-church group was listening days. Explicit times to listen to each other, to communities who feel sidelined, to those with whom we differ, and to God. Liturgy. We saw over the weekend, as little Oscar's death was mourned, that human beings long for a place to make a corporate response. Many of the churches have developed wonderful liturgical resources. Ongoing community engagement as another action point. It's difficult to underestimate the church's impact on the communities of which they are a part. And the church's involvement in community is often taken for granted, not noticed or forgotten. Job clubs, kids and carers clubs, women's group, after schools, youth organisation, cross community groups and cross community Bible studies and prayer groups. A question I often ask churches is this, would your community miss you if you closed your doors tomorrow? Many communities would miss their churches through this ongoing long term involvement the church demonstrates God's active concern for all. And we know 
that a core challenge in societal transformation and in positive peace building is dealing with the underlying issues, unemployment, education, ownership of democratic processes. The church is engaging with those issues in grassroots community work and we need to do more and keep on going. Another action is clearly pastoral care of all who've been affected by the Troubles and pastoral care includes advocacy. Our theological reflection must develop into action. It is not, I believe, an act of arrogance to suggest that the church has a role in being a catalyst for change in society. It's not an act of arrogance. It is an act of faith. Faith in God who loves the world and everyone in it. Faith that the life, death and resurrection of Jesus can bring real transformation. Faith that the Holy Spirit does enable human beings to submit all to the Lordship of Jesus and act in selfless ways for the good of others. I end with a blessing which I was reminded at the Church of Ireland General Synod. May God bless us with discomfort at easy truths, easy answers, half truths, and superficial relationships so that we may live from deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of God's creation so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger and war so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and turn their pain to joy. And may God bless us with just enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in the world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all our children and all our neighbours who are poor. Thank you.